Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I've got another of the Answers in Genesis critical thinking scan videos for you, this one on transitional fossils. So pre-video caveat time, I know that every fossil is technically a transitional fossil, but I'd imagine a creationist organization is going to focus on the examples where the transition between two categories is blatantly obvious, and attempt to explain why this blatantly obvious transition actually isn't blatantly obvious. But let's see for ourselves! Are transitional fossils evidence for evolution? Short answer, yes. Long answer, well I suppose the long answer is just yes with an explanation that a transitional fossil is the fossil of an organism that represents the transition between two related but different groups of organisms, so of course they are evidence for evolution. But I do like that creationists seem to have switched from a question of whether or not there are transitional fossils to explaining how these transitional fossils aren't evidence for evolution. And today let's begin part one of two videos on so-called transitional fossils, which supposedly represent animals in some intermediate stage of evolution, for example between dinosaurs and birds, between fish and land creatures, or between ape-like ancestors and humans. Sure. There's also the reptile mammal transition, the transition of whales from terrestrial ungulates to aquatic mammals, the development of modern equines from the hyracotherium, and these are just the well-known transitions. There are plenty of lesser-known transitions that just aren't as famous. Now, one of the things that is important to keep in mind here is that the best transitions are the ones that are represented by multiple organisms in a series. And also important to keep in mind is that I say series, but in reality the fossil record is a mess. So if there were multiple species that were headed in the same general evolutionary direction, one could have what could be thought of as a more advanced feature than another species that existed at the same time, but humans like to organize things in a way that nature usually doesn't. So what we often portray as a series could have been at least partially in parallel. Now back to the first thing that I said was important to keep in mind, a lot of times the features that we consider to be transitional are not all that remarkable when they're taken out of their evolutionary context. For instance, the involucrum in the whale lineage. If you just had an Indohyus by itself, the involucrum would be nothing terribly special, it's just odd that it's extra bony in the middle ear. But when you put it in its context, the only mammals known to have the involucrum in their middle ear are cetaceans, modern whales, dolphins, and aquatic whale-like fossils. Nothing outside of cetacean classification has ever been found to have this ear structure, not even the other marine mammals like manatees. So when we found Indohyus, a clearly non-whale semi-aquatic artiodactyl, it was not classified in the cetacean lineup. But on closer examination, there are other features that Indohyus has that are shared with the cetaceans, so it was determined that this artiodactyl was a representation of the cetacean transition from land to water, not based purely on its own features, but on how those features fit into the bigger picture. There are different examples of alleged transitional fossils. For instance, Tiktaalik supposedly represents a fish on its way to developing limbs. Sort of. In the case of Tiktaalik, it's not so much that it's just representative of the development of legs, it's that it's so very, very fishy, with gills and scales and the thin ray bones that would really suck to walk on, and yet it's also so very not fishy, with sturdy wrist bones, a neck, shoulders, and thick ribs that are more indicative of land-based tetrapods. And as with the whale example that I gave earlier, Tiktaalik is more meaningful when it is placed in its context. Panderichthys is more aquatic, less suited to land-based operations, while still being obviously related to Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik is a bit more adapted, not for operating on land per se, but more for propping itself up with its wrist to catch prey above it, using adaptations that could easily be adjusted in future generations for use on land. But then next we end up with Acanthostega, which looks a lot like Tiktaalik but with actual, like, fingers. A key point here is that likely none of these were terrestrial. Acanthostega probably lived in shallow, weedy swamps. Despite Tiktaalik often being shown crawling up out of a pool of water onto land, the transition to land likely did not happen in that specific lineage. I mean, as creationists are so fond of pointing out themselves, we have evidence of land-based tetrapods that are older than Tiktaalik. But the Tiktaalik transition is something that can help us understand what would have happened in the actual transition to land. And Archaeopteryx supposedly represents an intermediate between dinosaurs and modern birds. 
although the details have been up for debate amongst evolutionists. Yeah, creationists are fond of categorizing Archaeopteryx as a bird, but how many birds have a full set of teeth, flat breastbones, long bony tails, and three clawed wings? None. That's how many. In fact, Archaeopteryx is so very like a non-bird dinosaur that two specimens were once found that didn't have any preserved feathers, and they were misidentified as a species of Compsognathus, which is another small theropod that is most definitely not a bird. And once again, when we place Archaeopteryx in its context, it clearly represents a stage in the transition from theropods to modern birds, even though Archaeopteryx itself almost certainly is not the direct ancestor of modern birds. You can find much more information on these and other fossils in the linked resources. I bet you'll find better information on this and other fossils in my linked resources. Meanwhile, let's examine how to think through any transitional fossil claim more generally using the seven checks of critical thinking. First, check scripture. Because when figuring out how to think about a transitional fossil, it's best to first consult a book that was written by authors who didn't even know what a fossil was. Genesis indicates God designed creatures to reproduce according to their kinds. And Leviticus 19.19 forbids you from allowing cattle to mate with a different kind. So clearly different kinds can interbreed, rendering this kind distinction rather useless. So biblically, we would interpret a fossil as being halfway between two kinds. Yes, well, the biblical interpretation of what a transitional fossil is, is demonstrably wrong then, isn't it? Well, I mean, first you'd need to pin down what a kind even is in the first place before we could even make that determination, but I still think it's pretty safe to say that this interpretation is wrong. I mean, I suppose if you want to be pedantic, it might be possible for some organism to have existed that, should you divide its defining characteristics up, will have exactly half the characteristics of its ancestral clade and half of its descendant clade, but I think you'd need to take some pretty big liberties with several definitions in order to get that to happen. Saying that fossils represent an evolutionary process of death and suffering leading up to humans in particular challenges clear teachings from scripture, failing check to check the challenge. Your interpretation of scripture, yes. But when I read the creation story, I don't see anything that says there was no death before the fall. In fact, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden along with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, implying that you could die, but you would hold off death by eating from the tree of life. And when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, he explicitly said that that was to prevent them from accessing the tree of life, which would allow them to live forever. On top of that, God's threat of death before they ate the fruit would have been entirely meaningless to them if death was not something they were already familiar with. So maybe there was no suffering before the fall, maybe no organism died before it had lived a full and happy life, and that's what really made God call it good. Like, obviously not, this is completely ridiculous, but it makes a lot more sense than young Earth creationism just by virtue of the fact that this allows you to sneak evolution into the story without the whole thing falling apart because of this no death before the fall rule. And this whole no death before the fall thing is just one interpretation among many potential interpretations. And it's a dubious one at that. For check number three, check the source, you'll notice that any claim about transitional fossils can't come from a source which starts with God's word as its absolute authority because the word transitional already takes for granted that evolution between kinds is happening. Sort of, but not really. I mean, I guess you're right that nobody with an Answers in Genesis approved worldview is going to be publishing any meaningful research on transitional fossils, but that's not because we start with an assumption that the fossil we're examining is going to be transitional. Now, you are probably right that people working on transitional fossils nowadays just kind of start with the assumption that evolution is true, but this is not an unfounded assumption, it's that evolution has been tested over and over and over again by the scientific community and it has passed all the tests, and so is now an accepted scientific theory, despite your protestations. AIG likes to do this thing where they'll find a research paper that concludes something that they don't like. Fossil X is a transition between group Y and group Z, for instance. And rather than point out any legitimate problem with the paper's methodology or anything, they will instead harp on about how the paper just started with the assumption that evolution is true. They didn't prove evolution before they went about proving that this fossil was transitional, they just assumed evolution, and so by this assumption they were able to make a fossil fit into their predetermined worldview. Which 
sounds like a valid criticism if you're unaware of just how thoroughly demonstrated evolution is at this point. A scientist working in a field that has something to do with evolution does not need to start all of their papers off with a demonstration of evolution, because that's already been done. Expecting every bit of research that makes use of evolution to first start with a demonstration that evolution is a fact would be like requiring every astronomer to prove that the Earth is neither flat nor the center of the universe when publishing a paper on, say, the newly discovered but predicted to exist back in the 80s type supernova known as an electron capture supernova. No, these are such well-documented facts at this point that astronomers are free to start with them as assumptions, and if you doubt those assumptions, the relevant data is fairly easy to find. On that note, for check number four, check the definitions, some researchers recommend using the term intermediate form instead, because it doesn't imply the same evolutionary assumptions that transitional forms does. No, intermediate would have the exact same implications as transitional, but with the bonus that it's kind of harder to interpret it in the absurd crocoduck manner that so many creationists favor. Merely a quirk of language to make it harder to misrepresent, but that doesn't stop creationists from trying. But it's still worth clarifying what kind of intermediate we're talking about. I mean, does it look like something between two different kinds of creatures? It doesn't have to. Indohias doesn't look anything like a whale, it just looks like a weird stubby deer. And yet, it is a transitional fossil between artiodactyls and cetaceans. Or was it found in rock layers between two kinds, or both? Just being found in between two different species does not make something transitional, or intermediate if you prefer. One would have to examine its morphology, or preferably for more recent species, its genetics. Does its whole body look like an intermediate between two kinds, or does it have one feature that looks like it belongs to another kind, or does it have several features which look like intermediates between two kinds? What would it even mean for its whole body to look like an intermediate? Obviously, we look at the specific features, all of which do just happen to be contained on the body. Weird, I know. In the case of Indohyus, it's mostly the involucrum, but also the structure of the premolars, the density of its limb bones, and the stable oxygen isotope composition of its teeth. And given how far back it would be in the transition, these few similarities are enough to put it in the lineup. And once again, when you look at the entire lineup in context, it's not that there is one transitional species, it's that we can see the transition progressing from species to species. Clarifying what seems to be intermediate will help you identify the observational science, which is check number six. Well, I haven't used anything but observational science so far, and I doubt I'll have to appeal to anything that isn't observational science at any point in this video. But first comes check number five, check for propaganda. Messages that fossils like Tiktaalik and Archaeopteryx are transitional can sound convincing because they're repeated so often from multiple sources. Honestly, I mostly hear about them from creationists. Like, yeah, it's easy to find plenty of non-creationist sources using them as examples because they're the really obvious ones, but there are way more interesting examples of transitional organisms than the ones typically discussed in these sorts of materials. Like the Bashir, a fish with lungs that is fully aquatic, but has been successfully raised terrestrially by scientists. And because of a phenomenon known as phenotypic plasticity, a lot of the fairly major structural changes between aquatic and terrestrial animals, like more flexible neck bones for instance, were developed in just one generation. Whether museums or textbooks or even TV shows. But like episode 40 discussed, repetition cannot make a false message true. You're spot on there, but as I discussed in the part of this series where I covered critical thinking check number 5, AIG consistently fails its own critical thinking checks, right down to the propaganda one. Using information that Patricia herself gave us as the starting point to figure out if something is propaganda, I determined that Answers in Genesis fits her definition of propaganda perfectly. So, since Answers in Genesis is demonstrably propaganda by their own criteria for making such a determination, which should we trust on the matter? The museums and the collections of peer-reviewed scientific literature, or Answers in Genesis? I'ma go with the guys who don't fit the definition of propaganda. And yeah, repetition does not make something true, but these examples are not being repeated in an attempt to make them true. They're being repeated because they're good examples. If our earlier astronomer, who is not concerned about proving the globe Earth, were to frequently repeat that the Crab Nebula is a good example of an electron capture supernova that we've suspected might have been that type of nova for years now, but we haven't been able to confirm until now, he's not trying to make it more true by repeating it, he's simply making use of it as a good example. 
Neither can eloquence, popularity, or polished looking diagrams illustrating what artists think Fossil's living counterparts looked like. There is some artistic license with the artist's renderings, yes, but we don't make scientific decisions about where organisms belong on a phylogeny based on artistic renderings. If anything else, the scientific placement on a phylogeny is far more likely to have a significant impact on the art than the other way around. Such diagrams often have evolutionary assumptions built right in. Yes, because such diagrams are often used for teaching the scientific data as we currently understand them. Just as in the astronomy displays in museums, they have non-geocentric assumptions built in. Do you have a problem with that, or would you prefer that every display goes through the rigmarole of proving non-geocentrism? Recognizing those requires check six, check the interpretations. First ask, what's the observational science? At this point? All of the relevant science has been observational, even if I grant your bogus delineation between observational and historical science. What facts can we observe in the present? Well, in this case, the facts are the fossils themselves and the rocks they were found in. You're pretty close. The fossils themselves, the rocks they were found in, and the context of other similar organisms and their ecosystem. Sure, there is some interpretive wiggle room going on, but the wiggle room is nowhere near as large as you'd need it to be in order for your interpretation to be correct. And interestingly, those rocks don't always give dates that match a straightforward evolutionary interpretation or scenario, even using evolutionary dating methods. Because nature isn't always straightforward. Remember my thing earlier about evolution happening in parallel sometimes, with it not being a neat and tidy series? Yeah, that. But I have yet to see a creationist dating method that comes back with anything even remotely reliable and consistent. Usually the creationist dating methods can't even be applied to specific fossils, but are more generally things that just creationists think can't have been going on for billions of years. Like the recession rate of the moon, I've heard that called a dating method. But can it really be a reliable dating method when we know for a fact that it is not a constant? But more on that next time. When it comes to fossils, observational science doesn't always have much to go on, especially if the skeletons aren't complete. Well, in the case of Indohyus, we may not have a single complete specimen, but there were several individual specimens that were buried together, and their bones got all jumbled up to a point where we can't tell which individual any given bone belongs to. But we do have a mostly complete skeleton, and the other steps in the whale transition are very well documented as well. Sure, sometimes we'll find something like a single jawbone and then try to place that in a phylogeny based on the limited information we have from that one find, but the more complete a specimen, the more confidence we have in its phylogenetic placement, and the single bone species are in the minority. Ideas about what missing bones might have looked like, how that affected animals' body plans, and what animals' soft tissue, eye color, skin color, or even hair distribution looked like are all interpretations from historical science. Not always. In symmetrical organisms like mammals, if you find bones from the left side of the body, it is a very safe assumption that the bones on the right side of the body would have been identical but mirrored. So missing bones can be placed by looking at the bones we already have. There is also some body plan extrapolation that can happen. Say, for instance, we found the tibia and patella bones of the leg, and we found the pelvis, and we know that the femur goes in between those two, and we know what femurs look like, and we know the differences that can be found in femurs between different groups, so if we know we're looking at a mammalian skeleton, we can make accurate extrapolations as to what the femur might actually look like. Obviously, finding an actual femur from that species would be ideal, but it's not like scientists are just making shit up with nothing to go on. Same thing for soft tissue. We can make reasonable extrapolations from skeletal structure, but scientists are aware of the limitations. In fact, if you look up articles on something like, say, dinosaur mating habits, you'll find that scientists freely admit that we don't actually know for sure whether they use cloacas for mating. They likely did, just based on the relationship to birds and reptiles, but we don't actually know for sure. Now, for color, Yes, most of the artistic renderings of prehistoric animals are guesses based on similar living animals, but we have been able to glean actual data about the colors of organisms from their fossils. If you look up images of Cynoceropteryx, for instance, you will almost always see it depicted as an orangish-brown with white rings on the tail, a lighter underbelly, and a mostly white or gray face. This is because, in 2010, we found a fossil specimen with preserved melanosomes, which indicate pigmentation. And I could keep going, but mostly I just wanted to point out that even when she's right, she's wrong. Because 
Yeah, there is a lot of guessing when it comes to the appearance of some of these prehistoric animals, but nowhere near as much as she's making it out to be, and the parts that are actually guesses are not the parts that we use to demonstrate evolutionary relationships. If anything, our knowledge of the evolutionary relationships are what helps us fill in the gaps, such as with the dinosaurs probably having cloacas thing. Presenting these interpretations as facts in textbooks and museums is just a type of propaganda to make evolution look more true by appealing to aesthetics rather than facts. Nope. Museum displays are meant to provide factual details while capturing interest. When people see the bones of the animal, they want to see what it might have looked like as well, so they provide those drawings. Same thing with textbooks. The material itself is often quite dry, so illustrations are used to make it more interesting to students. But as I've said a few times already, we're not making the evolutionary connections based on the art, but rather the art is made based on the evolutionary connections that were made based on the actual scientific data. This line of argumentation would be like saying that Noah's flood didn't happen because Answers in Genesis just assumed that Noah's wife would have worn beaded jewelry like this. But we can't actually know how she would have been dressed, so the whole thing is a lie. Even though I do agree that Noah's flood never happened, this would be a really bad line of argumentation to use to reach that conclusion, and it is exactly what you are doing here. I imagine your response would be something along the lines of those clothing choices being a reasonable guess based on ancient Near East culture and traditions, but that it ultimately doesn't matter to the point of the museum whether she wore beads or not. Exactly. It doesn't matter if the dinosaur is reddish brown or greenish yellow. That's not the point, that's just a visualization to make it more interesting. And for the record, I decided to be nice and go with one of their less ridiculous examples. I could have brought up the fact that Answers in Genesis literally has a display in their museum depicting dinosaurs and giants fighting in a coliseum as though that were a thing that happened. But yeah, we guessed at some of the feather colors, so evolution is wrong. Also, remember, we can't directly observe function from fossils. No, we can't, but given our knowledge of modern anatomy and the similarities with prehistoric creatures, we can definitely figure out some functions. Like, would you disagree that a fin on a fish fossil functioned to flap the fish forward furiously? Okay, maybe you could disagree with the word furiously there, I just threw it in for the sake of alliteration, but a lot of the functions of structures can be figured out by comparing them to modern living organisms with similar structures to see how they use them, and when enough data is collected on a fossil and the environment it would have lived in, function can be reasonably inferred. If we had never seen a fish before but we found a fish fossil, it would be perfectly reasonable to infer that the fin was used for locomotion through water. We don't know exactly how creatures use some of these now fossilized features when they were alive. For instance, coelacanth fossils have lobed fins that some people, using evolutionary assumptions, originally thought represented precursor limbs. And why is thinking that it was a precursor limb in any way relevant to us figuring out what a creature used a structure for? Do you disagree that the coelacanth used its fins to navigate through the water? I doubt it. But studying coelacanth fins has helped us piece together the evolutionary development of limbs from fins. Until live coelacanths were observed using those same fins for swimming. That didn't change anything. They are still a good representative of precursor limbs, just like the fins of the Bashir. Just because the fish still exists does not mean the evolutionary information we gleaned from studying it is irrelevant. What are some other historical science interpretations? Well, the very label transitional fossil and any story about the past that goes along with it is interpretation based on evolutionary assumptions rather than a definite fact. No, the fact that a fossil is transitional is a definite fact. The interpretation comes in when figuring out which groups it's transitioning between, and even then, there are some that are just as plain as day, like the Archaeopteryx. What are some of those assumptions? Generally, transitional fossil stories assume Earth is millions of years old and that evolution can change one kind of creature into another. The Earth is demonstrably billions of years old. That is a scientific fact that is based entirely on observational science, and evolution does account for the diversification of species over time. This is also a demonstrable fact that is based on observational science. These assumptions have serious issues you can learn about in the linked resources. Again, my resources are better. They weren't written by people who think that dinosaurs once fought giants in a coliseum. So, what's an alternative explanation for intermediate-looking fossils? Satan! The devil made them look like they'd support evolution. 
Or God is testing our faith by making evolution the obvious answer, but it turns out it's the wrong one, so you need to have faith in God to get the right answer. We'll look into that more, examine how observational science compares, and continue with check 7 next time. Damn it, I wanted to see her actual answer. Does this mean I actually have to cover the next video in this series? I prefer jumping around. We'll see. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from John Phelan, who says, No, he's right. God is a big banger. How do you think he comes into everyone's hearts? For sure. Remember, you need to let Jesus come inside you in order to be saved. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the transitional form between my YouTube channel and the printing press. If you'd like to help humanity evolve technologically, then you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wish list, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my podcast with my daughter reading the Bible to her, and links to my social social media accounts, and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!